in pathology and trans medicine as at Santokh Bahadur Ji Hospital Jaipur. He was lead assessor and he's still, I think, lead assessor in NABH. He was an accreditation committee of NABL in New Delhi. He was technical committee member, chairperson of NABH, and accreditation committee member of Quality Council of India. He is technical committee member of lab, uh, lab certification in NABH. And as we all know, he is organized secretary of BQAS, which is our EQAS program, which is the first EQAS program in blood bank in India. He has started uh, the EQAS program. And he is still very active in Hello? academic programs and uh, many quality relatives, uh, seminars, yeah, all these educational activities. Thank you. So uh, over to you, I request Dr. Gupta uh, to uh, uh, give a few words to for this YPF webinar session. And I, I also want you to introduce our speaker, Dr. Amita Nayar. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. And thank you, Ankit. Uh, I got this opportunity to interact with young professionals of the field. Actually, I missed you a lot since uh, many time I was trying to connect with you people. But it's nice that uh, Aikaj and Ankit and everybody have given me again a chance to interact with you. Uh, today, I think uh, with the COVID and the pandemic situation which we are going, the topic which they have selected uh, for discussion is really good and uh, makes sense. Means uh, we all are seeing this new virus coming in and we all know that uh, this is not the first time since 2008 we are getting a lot of uh, virus mutations and a lot of virus. Fortunately, they never converted into pandemic and they remained as an epidemic form in uh, various countries. So this is something which uh, needs a thorough discussion. And uh, I think being a transmission specialist, we all know that uh, we, we are the one which uh, matters into quality when I talk of in medical science a bit a big way because when transfusion medicine uh, goes out of wire, it is the masses which are affected because of the quality. And uh, today I think uh, we have got a young and dynamic speaker. Ankit, can you uh, share the screen? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Anita uh, Radhakrishnan. Anita Radhakrishnan. And she is an uh, assistant consultant in Sri Chitra Trenul Institute of Medical Science, Trivandrapuram. Uh, very dynamic at this uh, young uh, forum uh, deliberation. And she has got three international and 12 national publications in her account. And she is actually working on a funded, funded project which is on autologous platelet-rich fibrin therapy in secondary healing of harvest site wound. And this is, I think we all know, this is very burning issues and a very good uh, project she's doing. And she's executive committee member for ISBTI Kerala chapter also. So I hand over the screen to Dr. Anita for uh, further uh, giving her presentation. Meanwhile, Puneet, can you check if Dr. Gajar has joined? Sir, I am on it. Uh, I am checking it uh, intermittently. As soon as he joins, I will make him the co-host. So, fine. So uh, uh, now I will stop sharing my slides. And uh, uh, I request Dr. Amita Naya to share your slides now. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, uh, I will be speaking on the emerging, re-emerging, and submerging transfusion transmissible infections today. And as sir rightly said, this is a very pertinent issue in the pan in the COVID pandemic. So, we'll directly go to the topic. So, first, we will see what are the characteristics which make an infectious agent likely to cause transfusion transmitted illness. So it is, it should cause a mild or an asymptomatic infection. If symptomatic, it should have a long incubation period before the symptoms develop. It should have a carrier state, a latent state or a latent state of infection. And it should have a blood bond phase, which should be in the asymptomatic or the carrier phase. Then it, the agent should be able to survive or persist in the collected blood components and should be able to survive our processing and storage 
and finally the organism should be identifiable in the recipient and it should cause a disease so these are the characteristics of an infectious agent which can cause a transfusion transmitted infection now we will see the definitions so first is emerging infections emerging infections are defined as new infections or infections whose incidence in human beings has increased within the recent past at least two decades or threatens to increase in the near future re emerging infections are defined as reappearance of a known infection after a decline in the incidence so this is the study which was published in the isbt science series in 2014 and they have looked at the emerging ttis from 1940 to 2004 and they estimated that about 5.3 new viruses are being discovered every year and this might not be an exact exaggeration if we see this time chart showing the emerging infections uh, starting from 1998 up to 2018 many of the infections might not be listed but these are the infections which were listed by the cdc and so many new infections are emerging on on a daily basis so what are the steps in the emergence of infections basically there are three steps first is the introduction that means a previously unknown pathogen contacts a new host population comes in contact with a new host population or an established pathogen changes its interaction with the host so that is the introduction then second is the adaptation this new pathogen adapts to its new host and starts multiplying in the adapted population and third is the dissemination in which there is multiplication goes on and it might result in explosive short outbreaks or it might be an insidious propagation and spread so basically there are three steps in the emergence of any infection first is the introduction of the host to a new of the pathogen to a new host then adapting to the host and then disseminating within the host population the factors which contribute to the emergence so to the introduction as we all know human animal encounters has increased in the last few decades and that might be because of the economic development human demographics and behavior changes technology and industrial developments and the international travel and because of the newer diagnostic modalities we are able to recognize new infections we are able to recognize infectious origin for a previous disease and because of the travel there is spread of new agents worldwide and these agents are adapting to the new environments and they are propagating and disseminating now what is the relevance of these emerging infections to our specialty so as transfusion medicine specialists it is our duty to see that the recipients blood product recipients receive a safe blood that is their right so to decide for this whether we can accept or defer a donor we should be knowing about the prevalence of these emerging infections in our donor population if an emerging infection is found to be predominantly affecting the young population that means a child or a very old population then it is of not much relevance to us then whether this emerging infection has a is a blood borne agent if not does it have a phase blood phase or a viremia phase which type of blood cells does it persist does the age is the agent able to survive the processing and the storage and whether we have got a screening uh, we have got a sensitive screening assay available and whether this infectious agent can be transmitted through the blood tissues or through organ transplantations so these are the relevant questions which we have to think and based upon the answers to these questions we have to take a decision to accept or defer a potential blood donor as well as this information will help us to investigate any unusual transfusion reactions with with the suspected infectious origin so if we look at these questions in the hiv background which was also once an emerging disease so let's just see these questions is hiv a blood borne agent yes prevalence of the agent in the donor population uh, not known at that time when it was discovered but definitely it was understood that it has got a higher prevalence in the young population then could it be asymptomatic yes it had a long asymptomatic period does the agent survive processing and storage that was not known at that time then whether it is transmitted through blood or tissues or organs yes what is the disease does it cause a disease yes it causes an aids after a long asymptomatic period and are there test available yes so if you see most of the answers to these questions are comes as yes so hiv is a very important transfusion transmissible infection and if we see in 1983 the time when the hiv was discovered 
this is a pamphlet which was given out uh, during that time to the donors uh, in the in england so if you see the pamphlet one question is will donors be questioned on sexual matters when they attempt to give blood definitely not because at that time they thought that hiv is not a disease that is going to affect the healthy responsible population healthy young population it's some disease that is seen in the gay population so it's not going to affect the blood donors but coming to present day if you see the our questionnaire it has got lots of questions that ask about the sexual behavior of our donor so that history has become quite important over the period when we have understood that uh, hiv is a transfusion transmitted infection and sexual route is one of the major routes through of which uh, transmission so coming to the transfusion transmitted diseases abb has got a committee which looks after these emerging infections and this consists of volunteer members with expertise in various areas of infectious disease and blood center operations and includes feedback from fda that is the food and drug administration center for disease control and prevention us defense department of defense and american society of hematology and this committee in 2009 it has come out with a list of infections which it thought is relevant and has got an actual or potential risk of transmission by transfusion so it compiled a list of about 68 infectious agents and described them in detail so this is the list of that 68 organisms so don't get scared seeing this big list i am not going to talk about each and every organism in this list i will be just elaborating upon them important ones and then summarizing the lesser important ones so first coming to the west nile virus so this west nile virus if you see it is not included in the list but this west nile virus is a very important emerging infection in india i will tell you okay so this west nile virus it belongs to the flavivirus family it is transmitted through the bite of mosquitoes it was already known as a pathogen of the birds with incidental infection of the horse and humans and that was a dead end but it emerged on a very large scale in new york in 1999 and then most of the infect most of the infected population they were found to be young inf infected population was found to be asymptomatic with a mild flu or a febrile illness but the older and immunocompromised individuals developed meningitis and usual death so uh, whether to call this as an emerging infection or a reemerging infection that we have to decide but this infection was already present and then it reemerged in us and uh, in the 1990s and then it caused widespread human disease with morbidity and mortality and by around 2003 if you see it had spread all over the world affecting continents and then it was also shown to be transmitted through blood transfusion and organ transplantation now if you see this picture it is uh, affecting america africa parts of europe australia and also parts of india are being affected by this west nile virus and then they estimated the risk of tti with west nile virus and they found that of the 10000 blood units transfused about 10 to 15 were found to be positive for the west nile virus so immediately in 2003 us introduced a pooled nat screening for the blood for west nile virus whereas uk and australia they first introduced a donor deferral and then later on they introduced the nat screening for the returned travelers and during the seasons when this west nile virus transmission was found to be very high now coming to our indian scenario there have been epidemic forms of west nile virus being reported from parts of rajasthan maharashtra andhra pradesh karnataka gujarat madhya pradesh orissa and uh, very recently in like 2011 there were uh, multiple reports of west nile virus even from kerala so this is one information that we all should be knowing because to have the to select or to defer a donor this information is very important so west nile virus is an emerging infection in india and what did europe do when they found that this infection emerged in europe so they introduced the nat screening for all donations including blood donations and stem cell donations and that was on a done on a seasonal basis when the cases peaked that was from july to november and then they designated areas as affected areas when one or more individuals were found to be infected with west nile virus or a positive nat positive donor was identified so that area was de designated as an affected area and any donor coming from those areas or had spent at least one night in these areas had to undergo a 28 day deferral and as a result of introducing this strategies they found that they had no cases of transfusion transmitted west nile virus infection reported in their national hemovigilance system 
and uh, they found that out of 10 lakh blood donations that were screened for West Nile virus between 2009 to 2014, 65 donations carried West Nile virus RNA. And this could be avoided trans being transfused to the patients. Next, we move on to the novel coronavirus. Now, this is going on. This pandemic is going on. Novel coronavirus, as we know, is known to cause SARS, MERS, and the recent COVID-19 pandemic. So this novel coronavirus, it was first recognized in China in November 2002. Now, let us see what are the risks. So TT, about coming to the TTA risk, the RNA is detectable in the plasma from 2 to 16 days after onset of acute illness. It replicates within the mononuclear cells of the peripheral blood. But its survival in the blood products is not known and transmission by blood transfusion has not been reported as yet. So because it persists in the blood cells and the RNA is detectable, we have to take measures to safeguard our blood supply. So what were the measures taken? One is the exclusion of the donors till their symptoms resolve. And second is the deferral of the donors who have been exposed or have traveled to these endemic areas. So these were the two safeguard measures that were implemented. And China, where this virus originated, they had some other uh, things to add to this. That, uh, that is the new questions were added to the donor questionnaire. That means have you traveled, have you, have you traveled, have you had contact history? Uh, and then the normal body temperature was added as a criteria for donor qualification. And the donors were encouraged to notify the blood center if suspected symptoms of SARS occurred within two weeks of donation. This was in China. And the FDA also came up with a series of recommendations. That is, in the past 28 days, have you been ill with SARS or suspected SARS? In the past two weeks, have you have had contact or traveled to a SARS endemic area? This information was additionally collected from the donors. And in China, they did one more thing. That is a look back studies to find if any cases of SARS transmission has taken place. So in all hospitalized patients who were identified with SARS, they inquired for a history of blood transfusion the last three weeks. And if there was a history of blood transfusion, the implicated donor units were identified, the donors were reassessed for their risk factors, and the other recipients who received the blood products from these donors, they were also assessed and monitored for the development of these SARS symptoms. And after all these studies, they found that there was no incidence of transfusion transmission of the SARS, of the novel coronavirus. And coming to the lab testing, there is no FDA licensed blood screening test available as of now. Only investigational uh, testing is available. Then LIC is reliable, but it can detect only after 21 days. Immunofluorescence assays can detect antibody after 10 days. And the PCR, which is available, real-time PCR, it has to be done on the nasopharyngeal aspirates and swabs. That is, the, that is not useful for blood screening. And the efficacy of leukoreduction is not known, but plasma reduction uh, techniques were found to be effective for novel coronavirus since it's an enveloped virus. Now coming to the novel corona 2019 novel coronavirus, again there have been no reports of TTA as yet, but 15% of the clinically ill patients had RNA in the plasma or serum. So it is, it, there is possibility that it can have transfusion transmission. So there are measures needed to ensure blood safety and uh, the uh, countries like Canada, Australia and the Euro, they have imposed a difference for 21 to 28 days after visits to these endemic areas and pathogen reduction measures are to be continued wherever feasible. Next coming to the dengue virus. So dengue virus is the most important mosquito borne viral disease in the world. It belongs to a Flaviviridae family. It's a single-stranded RNA virus, and the first documented transfusion transmitted case occurred in Hong Kong in 2002. Now, dengue virus is so widespread. It's only that we have to look out for any of the transfusion cases that we might come across. Only that the first case was discovered in Hong Kong in 2002. And it's endemic in our part of the world as well as in many parts of the world. Dengue has got an asymptomatic viremia of two to three days. And for screening, NAT assays are available only on a research basis. Otherwise, ELISA testing is available for IgM and IgG antibodies. For donor deferral, there are no FDA guidance or ABB standards available. But usually, ABB recommends that donors with dengue symptoms should be deferred for about 120 days after resolution of symptoms. And as per our Indian guidelines, we have a deferral of six months after infection 
and four weeks after visit to an endemic area. Leuco reduction is not found to be effective, but pathogen reduction technique is effective for against the dengue virus. Now, if we look, this is the worldwide distribution of dengue virus, and India comes in a high endemic zone of for dengue virus. But within India, we need to identify pockets which are endemic. So that information has to be available with the blood bank so that we can make an appropriate decision as to the donor selection. Next, coming to the chikungunya virus. Chikungunya virus belongs to the Toga Viride family. It's a single stranded RNA virus and it was first isolated in 1953 from a Tanzanian patient. And chikungunya, the name is derived from the Mekonde language, which means that which bends up. That is because of the intense bone pain, the patient might bend up. That is why it's called as chikungunya. And it's endemic with outbreaks in Africa, India, and Southeast Asia reported. Vector is, it is transmitted to the mosquito. It has got an incubation period of three to 12 days and viremia is present for the initial five days. No transfusion transmission has been reported as yet, but theoretically like dengue, this can also have a transfusion transmission is possible. So we have to be on the lookout. And uh, survival and persistence in the blood products is not known and donor deferral criteria have not been defined in either by FDA or AABB. But when this chikungunya virus first emerged in America, they came out with a list of possible mitigation strategies to reduce the risk of transfusion transmission. And uh, the uh, strategies they adopted was to have a pre-donation symptom screening to ask for any symptoms of chikungunya, to encourage the donors to notify the blood bank if they develop any symptoms after donation, defer the donors from the endemic areas, do not conduct camps in the endemic areas, continue the pathogen inactivation techniques already being practiced and wherever possible implement nucleic acid testing for chikungunya. Next coming to the yellow fever virus. So yellow fever virus has got a natural distribution in America and sub-Saharan Africa. It is again transmitted by mosquito and high titer viremia is detectable for about three to six days after infection. Though there have been no cases of natural yellow fever virus getting transmitted through blood. There have been reports of yellow fever vaccine associated transfusion transmission. And uh, for this, they advise that the donor has to be deferred for two weeks after receiving the live yellow fever vaccine. That is a 17D vaccine. And in India, for all live vac vaccines recipients, the deferral is 28 days. And if the patient has got any symptoms, he has to be resolved. He has to be deferred till the resolution of the symptoms. The lab testing is PCR. Leuco reduction, we do not know if it is beneficial. Pathogen reduction is definitely beneficial in case of yellow fever virus. Now, in case of yellow fever, because the Indians, they keep traveling and uh, travel restriction, uh, tra travel is a very frequent uh, uh, done by the Indian population, we have to have some travel uh, restrictions or travel guidelines as to whom we can accept or after what time of interval we can accept these uh, individuals for blood donation after a foreign travel or travel to these endemic areas. Such a guideline is not existing currently. Next, coming to the Zika virus. The Zika virus, it was first reported in Uganda and in 1947 and later it re-emerged in Brazil in 2015. It is a flavivirus family and again transmitted through the bite of mosquitoes. Most of the infections are asymptomatic or mild. And as we know, it is Zika virus infections are associated with neurological complications and microcephaly. Perinatal and sexual transmissions are reported. Also, transfusion transmissions has been reported. And Zika virus RNA has been identified in asymptomatic blood donors. So in response to the Zika virus outbreak, United States, uh, the FDA, they instructed their blood services to screen their uh, do donated units using NAT. In United Kingdom, they asked the uh, donors to be deferred for 28 days after return from the affected area. And if infected or symptomatic, they have to be deferred for six months. In India also, we were, we were given a travel advisory that after four months only, these donors should be accepted if they have infection or they have traveled to these Zika endemic areas. We also had a Zika virus outbreak in India, and this is a report that came in uh, WHO in uh, November 2018. As on November 2018, 157 cases has been identified in India, and uh, that was mostly in Rajasthan. 
So this information we should have, we should be having. So Rajasthan, some parts of Rajasthan might be having this infection. So whether it is endemic or not, that information we should be having. So uh, next we will move on to the emerging causes of post-transfusion hepatitis. So post-transfusion hepatitis has been investigated widely and as a result, a variety of organisms have come up as causes of post-transfusion hepatitis other than the usual, our known viruses. So first is the hepatitis B virus mutants. We, we have uh, studied about the wild variety of hepatitis B virus, but now mutants are also in uh, circulation. Now the mutation can occur either in the pre-core, core promoter or in the S genes. And the cause for the development of mutants, they say, is because of the increase in vaccination. That is, we are trying to suppress the wild variant. So the mutant variants are coming up. So we are trying to suppress by increase in vaccination, by administration of hepatitis B immunoglobulin, by the use of antiviral drugs, etc., which is uh, inhibiting the replication. And uh, the, because of the HBV, that is, the hepatitis B virus lacks a proofreading function, is unable to correct the mismatched nucleotides, and mutants come into circulation. Now the importance of identifying these mutations is that it might affect the uh, natural and induced immunity leading to an development of antiviral resistance. So even if the patient is taking antiviral, the infection might not get cured. And second, one more important point is that most of these mutants we might not be able to detect using our usual serologic and lab donor screening assays. HBV mutant has been reported to be transfusion transmitted similar to the wild type of HBV and it is known to be persisting indefinitely in the plasma and the cellular blood components. In immunocompetent individuals, a viremia has been detected to up to six months and in some individuals, a chronic viremia of more than six months has been documented. And in a study done in US, they found that 44% of the chronic HBV patients had these mutant variants. So it is very common. But in US, their uh, screening policy is that they do screening for hepatitis B surface antigen as well as the core antibody. And they say that because of these two testing, they are able to identify most of the mutants in the pre-core and the core promoter regions. The S gene mutants cannot be identified, which will be picked up using the NAT assay. But in India-like country where NAT assay is not available in, in every part of in all blood banks, and we do only HBS AG screening as a part of our mandatory workup, many of these mutants might escape our detection and may lead to transfusion transmitted hepatitis. So uh, in US, there another policy is that uh, their FDA policy is that to permanently defer any donor who has had clinical hepatitis after 11 years of age, regardless of the specific viral agent. So any viral agent causing uh, viral hepatitis after age of 11 years, that donor is permanently deferred. So, and because of that also, these mutants will not get transfusion transmitted in the US. So the US has safeguarded its blood supply, but we are running a risk. Next, coming to the hepatitis E virus. Now, this is a very emerging cause of post-transfusion hepatitis, and several reports are coming up from different parts of the world. And most of these chronic hepatitis linked to hepatitis E virus has been reported in immunosuppressed population who are receiving transfusion support. And so the NHS, that is the National Health Services in the UK, they have done a study on HEV infection, that is a hepatitis E infection and blood safety. And that was a retrospective study done over a period of 10 years in which they screened donors for the presence of hepatitis E virus RNA to determine the incidence of hepatitis E virus infection in the blood donors. And from those who were identified as positive for hepatitis E virus, those, re those recipients who received their blood were also identified and to establish the outcome of what happens if you receive a HEV containing blood or blood components. So they could identify 60 recipients who had received this HEV, con uh, HEV positive blood or blood components. Of this, 16 were not available for follow. 25 had no infections detected, but 90 had evidence of infection, either in the form of a positive RNA, which was seen in 12 patients, or a positive antibody response, which was seen in 7 patients. So based on that, this, they have introduced a recommendation that is the HEV screened negative blood components only should be given to immunocompromised patients or immunosuppressed patients for neonates who are less than one year of age, for uh, patients undergoing that is a solid organ transplant recipients, 
potential solid organ transplant recipients, any patient who is go, uh, receiving immunosuppressive therapy, patients undergoing extracorporeal procedures prior to uh, solid organ transplant, undergoing allogenic stem cell transplantations. All these patients should receive only HEV screened negative blood components. In case of autologous stem cell uh, transplant recipients, uh, there was no convincing evidence. So they, have, they, are, they are not recommended to, that recommendation has not been put forward. Next, uh, coming to the hepatitis G virus. So this hepatitis G virus, it was first reported in 1996 in China. It is a flaviviride, it belongs to the flaviviride family. It's an enveloped virus, RNA virus, and it is very structurally and epidemiologically very close to the hepatitis C virus. And it is seen as a single infection or in combination with HCV or HIV infection. And as uh, it's like HCV, it is very efficiently transmitted through parental routes of sexual contact within the local, that is a close family contacts and intravenous drug use and exposure to contaminated blood and blood components. But there have been lots of controversies regarding the hepatitis G virus. It was implicated in causing aplastic anemia and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but there was no proven data to show that it is causing. And uh, then uh, it was uh, also found that the prevalence was found to be 4.8% worldwide when the GV RNA was uh, using the GV RNA. And the prevalence was found to be a little higher in South Africans and Egyptian population. And it was found that more than 50% of the HIV infected patients had an HGV positive, HGV RNA positivity or positive for the antibodies. The viremic phase can last from weeks to years and it is able to survive in the blood products. And transmission by blood transfusion is well documented. But the main controversy regarding this was the hepatitis G virus was that some of the reports said that the presence of hepatitis G virus decreases the infectivity of HCV and HIV. So that uh, that one report, uh, many reports are available like that. But uh, recently, one study has been done in Chinese population. They looked at the prevalence of hepatitis G virus infection among the blood donors in China. And in some pockets, they found a very high prevalence. And they said their recommendation was to add HGV screening to increase the blood, uh, safety of the blood transfusions. But AABB has not taken up these controversies and this HGV virus still remains in the list of potential transfusion transmissible infections. But they say that no donor deferrals are needed because this HGV virus is not causing any disease per se. Like it is coexisting with HIV or HCV virus, but per se it, does, it is not causing any diseases. So no donor deferrals are needed and no specific antigen screening is required. That is a policy of, that is a recommendation given by ABB. So that's, about, that's all about the major viral infections. Rest of the viral infections I will just summarize at the end of my presentation. Next we will move on to the bacterial infections. So first is the Yersinia enterocolitica. So this is a gram-negative anaerobic bacilli. It's a frequent cause of diarrhea in third world countries. And the importance of Yersinia is that it is able to survive in our blood products. Uh, I will tell you the reasons. It has got a prolonged and recurrent or persistent bacteremia phase during which it can get transmitted. The growth of Yersinia gets enhanced by exposure to 4 degrees Celsius. So it can very well survive in our red cells. Then it can survive within the phagocytic cells and extracellularly. And when we deplete the plasma, when, we, uh, when the plasma content is reduced, that is actually encouraging uh, Yersinia to grow because the complement mediated killing of Yersinia gets inhibited in the absence of plasma. And when, whenever there is lysis of WBCs, these uh, organisms which are within the WBCs, they get additionally released. And whenever the RBCs undergo lysis and release iron, that will stimulate and support the growth of Yersinia. So Yersinia finds our stored blood a very good medium for survival. And there had been multiple case reports of transfusion of Yersinia from asymptomatic donors, from autologous donors, and even from the pooled platelet concentrates. Yersinia sepsis has been reported. Uh, coming to the lab screening, no FDA licensed uh, screening test uh, exists, but ELISA, IGM, ELISAs are available. Then one point we have to remember is that the cultures can be negative due to the intracellular sequestration. As a result, the cultures could be falsely negative and NAD-based detection assays are available. For donor deferral, no FDA or AABB guidelines exist. Leukoreduction, if we are doing to remove the Yersinia, it has to be done 
if it is if it has to be done as a pre storage because if it gets sequestered within the cells especially within the rbcs then we may not be able to remove then pathogen reduction we do not have sufficient data to comment on that and other preventive measures which the aabb recommends is visual examination of the blood bags for presence of any gross contamination testing of the rbc units by about 25 days or older to look for the presence of endotoxins to screen for the presence of bacteria using stain smears discarding of rbc units 25 days or older storage of rbc is at 0 degree celsius to delay and reduce the growth of yersinia enterocolitica so these are the recommendations put forward by aabb in their fact sheet next moving on to the rickett cell organisms so rickett cell organisms as we know these are obligate intracellular gram negative bacteria and um, uh, the common ones are the anaplasma coxella ehrlichia orientia shushugamushi rickettsia provasaki and rickettsia rickettsi these are the more common rickettsia organisms and these are endemic in many parts of north and south america an important point to remember is this it has been classified as a category b bioterrorism agent now bioterrorism is another thing which we have to be very careful because we are we have to be prepared to deal with the bioterrorism that i will come later in my presentation then uh, this rickett cell organisms they are viable in blood at 4 degree celsius for at least 9 days and there have been reports of transfusion and transmission by blood transfusion so the uh, abb recommends that four weeks their donors have to be deferred if they are returning from the endemic areas actually no screening tests are available nat and elisa has got a very low sensitivity and the efficiency of leuco reduction is also not known in for the rickett cell organisms now this is a table which shows the uh, uh, the outbreaks of rickets and infection in india between 2000 to 2018 so in india we have had multiple outbreaks of rickets and infections and this uh, information also we should be we should know so uh, rickets is endemic in many parts of india as well next we move on to the protozoan organisms and in this we will first consider babesia so many parts of us they are hyper endemic for the babesia organisms and this babesia it has got intermittent parasitemia which can be detectable for months to years and within the rbcs the babesia are known to persist for at least 35 days that is for the whole shelf life and trans uh, transmission by blood transfusion has been well documented the american red cross they reported 18 definite cases of transfusion transmitted babesia infection between 2005 to 2007 including five fatalities and uh, uh, currently fda screen uh, licensed blood screenings are not available but uh, the investigations they recommend is the blood smear microscopy indirect immunofluorescence elisa etc and uh, donor deferral uh, as per aabb the donors with babesia have to be permanently deferred and leuco reduction is uh, if, uh, it is unlikely to be effective because the parasite is within the rbcs and pathogen reduction also we do not have much data next moving on to the prion diseases human prion diseases and first i will be dealing with prion diseases other than the variant cjd so as we have, the term indicates the infectious agent is a prion protein and it is a member of the transmissible spongiform encephalopathy group which is known to cause kuru kruzfel jacob disease and variant cjd and the importance of this prion proteins is that it is resistant to the commonly used disinfectant such as formaldehyde glutaraldehyde ethanol iodine etc it is resistant but transfusion transmission to humans has not been demonstrated till date but through other organs such as dura mater human pituitary growth hormone corneal transplants it has been known to be transmitted and blood phase has been identified in some experimental animals but no human has been but not in humans and survival in blood products is not known it has got a very long incubation period of about 4 to 40 years and mortality 100 is 100% for symptomatic disease so according to fba these donors have to be permanently deferred now coming to leuco reduction uh, leuco reduction reduces the prion protein content but we do not know whether this is effective and plasma reduction strategies whether they are effective we do not know because data are not available but fda has uh, said that in case of a pooled plasma product in which an, an inadvertent uh, donor plasma has been donor which is who is at risk of having cjd has been included there is no uh, need for doing a recall of the pooled plasma products 
now coming to the variant cjd which is of more importance variant cjd is otherwise called as human transmissible spongiform encephalopathy this first occurred in uk in 1994 and it was first recognized as a distinct disease in 1996 by october 2008 206 cases and 203 deaths had been reported worldwide and most of these deaths occurred due to dietary exposure to exported uk beef products now the coming to the differences from the normal cjd or the wild cjd so the in case of variant cjd the average age of patients is 26 years that means much younger the incubation period is shorter about only 5 to 15 years and this prion protein the most important point is that this prion protein has got widespread replication in the lymphoreticular tissues so there is chance of transmission through blood products and it is likely to survive in the blood products for its entire storage period and when they uh, did experimental studies they were able to see that transmission by blood transfusion occurred in more than 36% times in when they did the experiments in sheep and then in 2004 there were two case reports which uh, had a suspicion of this variant cjd getting transmitted through blood transfusion and uh, in total they had identified four infected recipients who had received blood from three donors who had later developed variant cjd of these four uh, recipients three recipients developed variable cj variant cjd and one died before development of any clinical symptoms but on autopsy his splenic tissue showed prion protein that means he had carried the infection and all these uh, units were transfused prior to 1999 and it was non leuco depleted red cells and in 2007 we had one more case report of a spread of variant cjd through blood transfusion so uh, as per fda uh, it is a permanent deferral criteria so they say that uh, any individual who has been residing in uk for 3 months or more from 1980 to 1996 he should be permanently deferred from blood donation and 5 years in the rest of europe or has received transfusion in uk or france that also five years that is between 1980 to 1985 these donors have to be permanently deferred leuco reduction efficacy is not known uh, pathogen reduction uh, also data are insufficient and there was one case report of a patient a suspected hemophiliac patient who developed variant cjd from the pooled plasma derivative which was known to be contaminated with this variant cjd so there are some questions which remain unanswered like in spite of this uh, being a very transmissible infection why have there been not more transfusion cases except a, a, a one incident that happened in 2007 and whether leuco depletion which was implemented after universal leuco depletion which was implemented after 1999 whether it became it is more effective than what we are finding so the, the answers will require surveillance for many more years because it has got a longer incubation period so that surveillance is still continuing and in 2016 their uk transfusion medicine epidemiology review study on crossfell jacob disease and blood transfusion said that this study is ongoing and no new cases of transmission transfusion transmitted by cjd has been detected since the last case of 2007 now i shall just uh, summarize the uh, uh, other infections so i shall just tell only the very important ones in which transfusion transmission has been documented so one is the colorado tick fever virus in which there has been one case report and this colorado tick fever virus is known to infect the rbcs and uh, and it is endemic in the us and canada and uh, abb recommends a 6 months donor deferral then there is another virus called the crimean congo hemorrhagic fever though transfusion transmission has not been documented it is a bioterrorism agent and has been categorized as category a then we have the eastern equine encephalitis virus this also single case report is available but the more importance is that this is also a, can be used as a bioterrorism agent category b bioterrorism agent then we have the epstein barr virus epstein barr virus multiple case reports of transfusion transmission has been documented it remains as a latent virus in the b lymphocytes and it is viable uh, viable in the stored blood products as well so most of these donors who come in the symptomatic stage they are anyway deferred from donation 
and leuco reduction and prt that is a pathogen reduction techniques are found to be effective for epstein barr virus then we have the hepatitis a virus hepatitis a virus also multiple case reports are available of transfusion transmission particularly in the neonatal population it is known to persist in the blood for about 7 to 14 days and infectivity remains preserved in the stored blood components and uh, the incidence of hepatitis a virus infection is more in countries with poor sanitation who they uh, abb they recommend 120 days deferral after development of infection whereas the indian guidelines after hepatitis of any cause they ask for a one year deferral then we have the human herpes virus the human herpes virus also has been documented uh, to be transfusion transmitted it is present in the uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells then human parvovirus case reports are available it is it persists in the blood uh, in the uh, stored blood products then we have the lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus though transfusion transmission has not been reported it has been known to be uh, transmitted through transplantations liver kidney lung cornea transplantation patients have developed this infection then we have the tick borne encephalitis this also two case reports are available from finland then another virus is a spuma virus in which one look back study was done and they identified one donor with the spuma virus and all the four recipients who received blood from this donor developed infection it's endemic in asia africa it's endemic and in canada they have a permanent deferral policy for spuma virus infection now next coming to the bacterial infections so the first is the listeria monocytogenes this listeria monocytogenes there have been multiple reports of the platelet contamination due to listeria monocytogenes but no transfusion transmission has been documented platelet culture on culture they have found to be positive for the listeria monocytogenes and this listeria monocytogenes it can survive at 4 degrees celsius also then borrelia species multiple case reports are available it can survive in rbc platelet ffp it can survive and it has been transfusion transmission has been documented similarly for brucella species also case reports are available after transplantation bone marrow transplantation then coming to the uh, more uh, organisms which are more common in india that is a leishmania uh, case reports are available of transfusion transmission it is endemic in southeast asia abb recommends one year deferral whereas in india it is a lifetime deferral for toxoplasma gondii case reports are available and mostly it is with the grand site transfusion that toxoplasma has been transmitted uh, abb recommends one year deferral for these uh, donors then trypanosoma cruzi there, there is a single case report of brucey infection and seven case reports for the cruzi infection and lifetime deferral is advocated by the abb filaria when uh, when blood containing microfilaria is transfused to a recipient the recipient usually develops an allergic reaction to microfilaria and uh, the uh, abb recommends a lifetime deferral of such donors so that was the summary of the in, uh, emerging infectious agents then in addition the in this uh, uh, fact uh, sheets they have also listed these bioterrorism agents so this bioterrorism agents depending upon how quickly they can cause the death and how quickly they can spread in a population in a given population they have classified the organisms into two categories it is a category a agents and category b agents now because of the high mortality that these agents cause and because of the rapid spreading and symptomatic infection these organisms cause it is very unlikely that these donors might come for blood donation but then uh, cdc advises all blood centers to be prepared in, in the event of blood uh, in the event of a bioterrorism and the preparedness is to like uh, to be ready with the with any screening modalities if available and to defer such donors by identifying the symptoms okay then uh, finally coming to the the abb has uh, recognized some of the emerging infections has prioritized these emerging infections into three categories depending upon the scientific evidence that is available regarding transfusion transmission the public perception and the public concern regarding this uh, disease agents so the red priority agents include this variant cjd the dengue virus and the babesia species the orange category includes the chikungunya 
the St. Louis encephalitis virus, which only has, there is a theoretical risk of transmission, the Leishmania species, Plasmodium species, and the Trypanosoma cruzi. Then yellow priority agents include the chronic wasting disease, which is again a prion disease, hepatitis A virus, HHV8, HIV variants, which are, very, uh, which are now emerging like the HVV variants, mutants of HIV virus. Then human uh, parvovirus B19, influenza virus, spuma virus, and Borrelia burgdorferi. So these emerging infections will continue to emerge. So what we can do to reduce the risk of TTA? What strategies we can adopt? So first and foremost important is to have the donor eligibility criteria clearly defined. Who to accept and who to defer, when to defer, how much period to defer. These criteria should be clearly made out. Then we should have a good uh, processing and quality control. The screening test that we are using should be sensitive enough. The storage should be done at optimum temperatures. Pathogen inactivations, if can be practiced, it is very good. Then indications for transfusion should be clearly defined and there should be rational product use, rational use of all blood components. And most important and that we should not forget is that all the patients who have received transfusion, they should be kept in follow-up and any infections that should be traced and reported to the hemovigilance. So only if we have a robust surveillance, threat periodic threat assessments and know the triggers for action and intervention and implement it and look for the assessment of the uh, efficacy of implementation, then only we might be able to overcome these emerging infections. And from all these st uh, studies, that only plausible solution that comes to mind is the pathogen inactivation that can act as a blanket solution. Okay, and finally, I will finish my presentation with the submerging infections. Uh, so submerging infections, uh, first is the xenotropic murine leukemia virus. Uh, so if you search the net, you will find plenty of articles, even recent articles coming up on this xenotropic murine leukemia virus. This was first described in 2006 in association with prostate cancer. Then in 2009, again, it came up in association with chronic fatigue syndrome. There are numerous case reports describing this virus, but it has not been confirmed in any other laboratories. And most of the positive findings have been thought to be because of the contamination. And the relevance to transfusion medicine, the relevance came when this virus was found to be in uh, a large proportion of normal healthy pop population. So this was an infection which was never, uh, like this was, this infection never existed. This virus never existed. And even now, as recent, uh, like you can see much publication on this virus, even in reputed journals, you can find these publications. But transfusion transmission has not been documented and it is not listed in the uh, AABB also. Then second is a transfusion transmitted virus. And uh, this was first, uh, it came up as a cause of post-transfusion hepatitis in 1997. And then in 1998, there was an earlier report in, published in Lancet about this virus. This TTB virus, it is otherwise called as TORC Tino virus. And it was first identified in Japanese patient who presented with post-transfusion hepatitis. And uh, it's a non-enveloped DNA virus. 16 different genotypes has been identified. and. Uh, it has been detected in non-human primates as well. And uh, around uh, 10 to 40 percent of healthy persons are found to be infected with this, are found to carry this TORC tenovirus infection. And it has been implicated in a variety of diseases, but none has been proved. And the current, uh, like, uh, the current thinking is that this TTV virus simply acts as a bystander without much impact on its single or co-infection with other viruses. Then we have the SEN virus. This was uh, first found in an HIV uh, infected IV drug abuser. And uh, it was found in about 30% of post-operative transfusion recipients and uh, in 3% of post-operative patients without transfusion. And they established the transfusion transmission by looking at the sequence homology. Transfusion transmission was established. But then uh, the current thinking is that the SEN virus just acts as a bystander virus and it is not causing any diseases. Uh, so uh, the ABB recommendation for the TTV and the SEN virus was that uh, persistent pyremia is there, it survives refrigeration, uh, transmission, transfusion, transmission occurs, but then it is not causing any diseases. So there is no need for any donor deferrals or donor screening. Now all this we've uh, learned, like we were talking about the world situations. Now coming to our Indian context, 
like india is a very big country we have got diversity and likewise we have got diverse uh, emergence of infectious agents coming up in different parts of our country so this is a like picture showing the emergence of different outbreaks from 1990 to 2011 and uh, we have to uh, like we have to strengthen our epidemic preparedness we should have a good public health infrastructure the communication and networking should be good we should have information about the endemicity of uh, infections in different parts of our country and there should be a, uh, research type taking place in these uh, in, uh, emerging infections there should be a political commitment and this is a list of uh, emerging viral infections uh, viral infections many of these virus names we might not find in any other site in the cdc site i search these virus names are we are not finding ganjam virus banja virus chobar george virus cat q virus so information and uh, info, that is data regarding these viruses has to be generated from the indian subcontinent in itself so it is the need of the hour that the transfusion medicine specialists and public health experts from india start taking account of these infections which are emerging in the indian subcontinent and uh, like study about the prevalence of these infections in our donor population identify the endemic areas within the country and notify uh, find out the survival and persistence of these organisms in the stored blood and based on these come up with acceptance and referral criteria then uh, definitely guidelines on foreign travel and blood donation has to be generated and then we have to investigate for any unusual transfusion reactions with a suspected infectious cause so i'll sum up my presentation uh, in this fight against this emerging infectious organisms it's only our bits which will save us versus their genes thank you for your patient listening thank you thank you so much dr amita it was a comprehensive presentation on various emerging and reemerging uh, uh, infections for transfusion uh i just want to inform everybody dr gajjar joined us just soon we start the the speak uh, the talk and uh, i would like dr gajjar to say a few words about the webinar program and comment on the the topic uh, dr gajjar please sir sir unmute yourself sir sir unmute uh thank you ankit i just joined on the beginning of the slides unfortunately i could not join because of the some problem in the internet but i tell you very frankly the this uh, uh, so presentation is very excellent but i want to say something ke what is the take home message by these uh, uh, scientific presentations in a, in a, in, a, in our country what what is requirement that uh, what what should be the donor screening criteria how it has to be updated since two or three years back the nbtc has already uh, published the new donor criteria new donor selection and the deferral criteria second most important what type of the screening technology or type of the screening test should be included as a mandatory into the food and uh, in, into the drug and cosmetic act which is very much because we are only stick to the only test hiv hepatitis b hepatitis c and the syphilis and the malaria so what new tech, uh, test testing should be included for safety of our blood transfusion that is a uh, my submission in this uh, platform thank you thank you sir thank you so much Hello. for your valuable inputs i request dr gajendra gupta to comment on the topic sir uh, uh this is a excellent presentations very excellent present i give him a I give him a big uh, 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 uh what can i say it it covers everything uh, uh, uh the emerging and uh, sub emerging and the re emerging pathogens across the globe and in our country so i uh, appreciate the presentation of by the by the these presenters excellent presentations dr gajendra gupta unmute yourself sir gajendra sir unmute yourself sir we are not able to hear you are a excellent presentation doctor dr Thank gajendra you, gupta sir unmute yourself
is he there or not he, he is there i can see him he is talking but he has still um, yeah, yeah the host was not allowing me to unmute and i was trying to unmute again oh. <laughs> you have i think the host have blocked me okay that is not the matter i think dr amita it was really good presentation it covered all but since i have gone through you see in 2018 one of the slide which you showed zika virus it was in jaipur where i am practicing i think so i have gone through that epidemic also and now through this uh, pandemic and covid 19 i think you have shown that uh, still there is no proven case of tti of proven covid 19 we all know but uh, since two months since uh, for all my donors so I, i think things will come up we have to develop something on it but 20% of donors have got igg who is not giving a history of any malaise or fever or contact with a person with the covid uh, for last 6 months so this i am i am i'm seeing i'm keeping a record i'm tracing it but uh, i think now is the time where uh, young forum has to prepare something like we should not uh, dig the well when we are thirsty i think we have to prepare something because these trend of epidemic can keep on coming so we have to actually all sit together and develop some guidelines like Zika virus came in Shasti Nagar. We have seen that paper. We have shown that paper. So for a for a year time, we earmarked five kilometer area near around Shasti Nagar that will not conduct camps there. Okay. So I think we we all have to sit together, have a big brainstorming, and develop some module. And kind of thing when it comes, we don't start uh, making the guidelines there and then. I think this is enough time, and this is the right time. And your presentation has given up. a lot of insight means i was really worried seeing the slides which you have shown number of tti's which can come up that was that was horrifying but uh, i think we all know this and we have to be prepare ourselves for something like this but nice presentation it has covered all and i think i enjoyed thank you uh, dr gajen dr yes. gajen yes sir uh let me tell you the two things one thing is we should sit together and do the brainstorming and the donor criteria selection and the different criteria this is most important mm -hmm. second most important is what uh, uh, what new test uh, testing methodology should mm -hmm. be included into the drug and cosmetic act which is mm -hmm. more required because we are only doing the test for the only five uh, markers we have no, since many years since many years so we have to uh, sit together and what new markers or the new testing markers are included that is more important second most important i will tell you that i am working in the covid since 6 uh, month i and i know that the go uh, government has started the antibody testing in so many areas people are coming up with the igg antibody positive as you said they don't show any type of the symptoms or the signs but that is a sub clinical or you can asymptomatic corona infection is likely to be there and that has created the antibody titer increase antibody titer into the healthy persons this is i have seen in our amdavad that's what is that is 20% is the rate of this igg positive and healthy blood donors which i am doing for last few months i am so telling about the corona for covid antibody yeah Okay, can, I, can I give a comment on this thing? Uh, see, uh, well, it is small comment, but it is uh, it is very highly debatable because being a member of the National Hemovigilance Program, there is no section where we have we can report the transmission transmitted infection because when it was being developed, there was a concern about the laws and the bylaws which is. Uh, Uh, usually associated with the transmission transmitted infection but uh, listening to the uh, the topic of by dr amita as well as the we are facing such a big pandemic across the globe i think uh, this is a time just like dr gajet told that we should have some brainstorming on the donor selection criteria i think we must now also insist on the hemovigilance program also to include a section on the transmission transmitted infections uh let me tell you dr dibasis that the hemovigilance program is not so strong 
in every blood bank just issue the blood then after if there is no transfusion reaction within the two days three days or seven days nobody bothers about what happened to that transfusion to that patient uh, to the patient telling you it's a debatable is highly debatable is the comment very simple but it's highly debatable and i think we must uh, when we are facing such a situation now it is a learning lesson okay for us and we have made the our our ultimate goal and aim are to make a blood safer okay so that the recipients are get the best possible blood and blood products so in those those scenario i think uh, we must we should not uh, stay back in the with, with a age old practice we must move forward Uh, 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 I want to submit a one sentence. If any 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 recipient is received a blood from the blood uh, center, whether it may be a RBC or plasma, uh, any plasma product or a plasma, a uh, the blood bank is a duty of the blood bank to contact the recipient on the mobile every two months, six months, or the every year that any type of the transmission infection has occurred to him or not. i think that will give you the uh, uh, that will give you the idea about the hemovigilance but most of the uh, cases will be asymptomatic no? the patient will never able to say that whether they have developed or cases or not it is the clinician when they come for the follow up as a routine practice they are doing all the other uh, tests they should recommend that they should test the this particular but there are some lot of controversies are there i think this is not the right platform to discuss those issues It is uh, just because. No, no. Donor should, uh, recipient should be uh, uh, asked after the at, a, at a some duration of the time whether they have any type of the uh, transmission transmitted infections which is developed which has uh, which has developed in their uh, in them. Yes. That is, I I I believe. It. I want to check with the participants. Any participants? Anybody has any question for Dr. Amita or to the chairperson? Kindly. either write on the chat box or unmute yourself and ask the question i have not seen any question so uh, yes sir i have a question yeah please i'm dr elvis from st johns medical college please. Uh, i'm a pg from st johns my question is how feasible is the implementation of pathogen inactivation in a routine processes what are the costs that are Involved in it, and what are the limitations? Why are we not able to implement it at the in the current scenario? Doctor Amita, could you understand the question? Yeah, yeah, I I got the question. Pathogen detection. Why? Like, what is the feasibility of introduction in India? Like, there are some studies. Uh, some papers are out. Uh, from india regarding this pathogen reduction techniques but i think that has to be taken up by the dnc act that license has to be there for this pathogen reduction products can like reduced products can be utilized that has to come in the dnc act itself that has to come then only i think that uh, then cost is a very important factor so i think uh, gupta sir might be more able to tell on that it is not included into the drug and cosmetic act i think so actually but, but at the industrial at the industrial level if you see now yeah. reliance is giving you viral inactivated plasma for use so i think as an industrial level if it has come i think uh, if it is cost feasible and it comes with a proper handling it, it will not be very difficult i think and down the line we'll see it happening but because reliance uh, uh, if i am not wrong this pathogen activation techniques are available only for platelet and plasma more or less Red yeah, yeah. Is still, it's not applicable, which, which is the RBC most is important part of our uh, whole blood transfusion system. Any yeah, other question? You are question? right, Doctor Ankit. You are right. It is only for yes, the correct. platelets. Yes, correct. Only for plasma, plasma and platelets, it's available. RBC, no FDA approved or so, not available. Not even in the Western countries, also. Correct. But these bacterial infections are the the platelet contamination is a very big problem in India, I think. Sir. any other question i am i am not seeing any question from any participants now so uh, i request uh, dr gajendra gupta and dr gajja sir to just uh, uh, the concluding remarks from both of you 
ஆயிரத்தொள்ளாயிரத்தி <laughs> this uh, dr jindal i tell you you have selected a nice topic and included me and the dr gajendra and dr nebasis into this uh, session it was a, it is a very excellent i tell you it's very excellent and uh, it gives you the idea how many pathogens are likely to be transmitted to the blood transfusions and we should be aware of it and we should plan out our blood safety program accordingly accordingly is a scientific presentations uh, i uh, and I, i appreciate dr amita's presentations she covered almost all the pathogens which are existing into the globe not in our country in the globe which are likely to be transmitted through the blood transfusions i appreciate thank you and i appreciate to all of you you young are doing very well and you are uh, including us all the aged person and the senior most person and i thanks for it also thank you sir and so, i always wish that you include us in the at least into the your all the sessions so we can listen the latest uh, recent uh, 